Hi, we start a new topic and it's called uh, compounds containing the carbonyl group and this in the top right hand corner is uh, the carbonyl functional group with a carbon and up and down is attached to either hydrogen or uh, alkyl groups uh, but it's importantly it's double bonded to an oxygen atom and oxygen as you know is um, electronegative uh, so it's going to pull electrons uh, towards itself and become uh, a delta negative leaving the carbon uh, delta positive and that uh, leaves the carbon open to attack from uh, nucleophiles which are negatively charged either partially or fully uh, and that's what this topic is all about but we start uh, with the first lesson and that's to look at the aldehydes and ketones which you've met briefly before what we're going to do in this video is um, revise uh, nomenclature, uh, revise testing, and then we're going to have a, a look at uh, reducing the aldehydes and ketones. Um, we've done the reverse of this. Uh, we've oxidized alcohols into aldehydes and ketones. Now we're going to do the opposite and reduce them back. Um, and then we're going to have a look at some nucleophilic addition reactions and have a look at their physical properties too. Okay, so let's crack on. Okay, let's uh, start by having a look at uh, some aldehydes and ketones uh, in nature. And we've got a picture of ice cream here. It's actually vanilla ice cream. And um, that's because there's an aldehyde called uh, vanillin, uh, which is this one here, that is what gives uh, vanilla its uh, aroma and its taste. Um, now it's an aldehyde. We can see that it's an aldehyde because um, although we've got a skeletal structure here, uh, this is a carbon and of course it's bonded to the hydrogen. We don't bother drawing the hydrogen in skeletal structures. Um, but uh, you can see we've got hydrogen coming off one end and uh, this whole group here counts as uh, uh, an R, an alkyl group. Um, this is actually, actually a, a benzene ring with an ether link and a hydroxyl group hanging off the benzene ring as well. Uh, so quite a complicated uh, aldehyde, but there it is. Uh, so that's uh, vanillin. Here we've got some cinnamon uh, and also the uh, aroma from uh, cinnamon is uh, also made by an aldehyde. Uh, we've got the hydrogen uh, drawn here uh, in this case. And uh, uh, this aldehyde is called cinnamaldehyde. That's the common name at least. And again, we've got a big long um, uh, hydrocarbon group hanging off here. And uh, so that is what gives uh, cinnamon its nice smell and flavour. Moving on, we've got some spearmint here. And this time we've got a ketone. Here's the ketone. And so our this is our carbon, our carbonyl carbon, which we can also call our alpha carbon. Um, and you can see uh, either side of the alpha carbon is another carbon on this uh, uh, ring. And because there's carbons on either side of the uh, alpha carbon then this is a ketone it's actually it's also a this is a chiral carbon here this one here that i've just drawn uh, with this bond here uh, coming out of the page um, and uh, so that one that uh, ketone is called um, l-carbone whereas the one that uh, gives the aroma for uh, caraway seeds as we see in the picture here, is decarbon, which is drawn here. Uh, so the same uh, enantiomer, but sorry, a, a different enantiomer of the same molecule, uh, where the bond here goes back into the page. Okay, so we have a couple of aldehydes and a couple of ketones there, just uh, to illustrate that um, lots of the aromas that we uh, we smell are from aldehydes and ketones, not just esters. So let's have a look at naming a few aldehydes and, and ketones. But first, let's just remember the, uh, the basic structure of aldehydes and ketones. With an aldehyde, uh, we have a alpha carbon and off one side of the alpha carbon is a hydrogen. The other side is an al alkyl group. And uh, so this is an aldehyde. And when we're writing the uh, structural formula of an aldehyde, then it's um, a little bit confused it can be confusing with alcohols because we've got carbon oxygen and hydrogen and as you know as an 
alcohol would be uh, COH, but uh, with an aldehyde we write, C, we write CHO. Um, and uh, that's how it is with aldehydes. Let's uh, draw the structure of a, uh, of a ketone. Again, we've got the alpha carbon with the uh, carbonyl um, group there. And this time off the alpha carbon is an alkyl group in, on both sides. Uh, so this is the ketone. So our, our carbonyl group can be uh, in the middle or in not doesn't need to be at the end of a uh, of a carbon chain. Let's let's call it in the middle. I don't mean directly in the middle so that it's symmetrical. They're not all symmetrical, but um, it's not at the end, middle of uh, carbon chain. And that has implications when we come to uh, name it. Uh, whereas the carbonyl group in an aldehyde um, is at the end of the chain. Okay, let's, uh, let's start uh, with a few to name. Uh, here we've got a displayed formula and we can see from the hydrogen hanging off the alpha carbon, the carbonyl carbon, uh, that this is an aldehyde. And now what we want to do is we want to count the longest carbon chain. Uh, so that would be this one. So we, we're going to name the carbon that's got the carbonyl uh, group number one. And so we name one, two, three, four, five. And we always want to give the uh, carbonyl group the, uh, the lowest number. So that's why we do that. Um, so uh, the alkane that has uh, five carbons is, of course, pentane, uh, right? So, uh, so pentane, uh, pentane is going to be in the name. It's an aldehyde, so it's going to finish off with pentanal. Uh, but look, we've also got um, uh, another group here with two carbons on it, hanging off the second carbon on the main carbon chain. Uh, so that uh, two carbons makes it an ethyl group and it's hanging off the uh, second carbon. Uh, so it's going to be two ethyl pentanol. So two ethyl pentanol. Uh, so there's the name of that one. Let's, uh, let's try another one. And first of all, we're going to spot the alpha carbon or the carbonyl carbon. Um, and notice that we've got uh, carbons joined both sides to that alpha carbon, so it's a ketone. Uh, so it's gonna, the name is going to end in own, um, like that. And the first thing we want to do is number our carbons on our main carbon chain. And we want to do that to make the carbonyl group be on the lowest number possible. So that means we start off uh, making this one number one, two, three, four, rather than the other way around, because then the carbonyl group will be on carbon three. So it's, so the carbonyl group in this case, in the correct case, is on carbonyl two. So it's going to be something to own. Um, and then we're going to count the carbons on the main chain. There's four, so that's going to be butan. Butan to own. But look, we've got a uh, methyl group here hanging off the third carbon. So it's going to be three methyl. Three methyl butan two O. So there we've got one example of uh, each aldehyde and ketone uh, coming from the displayed uh, structure to the name. Let's do it the other way around. So here we've got a name propan two O. So the own ending tells us the ketone. Uh, so the two is going to be um, the carbon the carbon on which the carbonyl group is. And our probe is going to tell us that it's three carbons. So um, let's, draw, let's draw our, our three carbons and sort of get an idea of what it's going to look like already. So I can draw it bent like that. Uh, so probe, there's our three uh, carbons. Um, if we wanted to number them, it would be one, two, and three. Uh, it doesn't matter which way we order it because so there's only three carbons there. Um, and if we wanted to put the hydrogens in, we would put our three hydrogens on, on each of those carbons. Uh, 
like so, and that would be propane 2 -ohm. Should we try another one? We've got 2-methylbutanol. Okay, so uh, the al tells us it's an aldehyde, so the uh, carbonyl group's going to be at the end. Uh, but, butan tells us there's going to be uh, four carbons in the main chain, uh, but it looks like we've got a methyl group uh, on the second carbon. Okay, so let's draw our main carbon chain. One, two, three, four. And it's an aldehyde, so we're going to have a hydrogen on the end and a double bond oxygen, a carbonyl group on, uh, on the first one. And then we can number these from right to left. So that means this would be the second carbon, would be this one here. Uh, so that is the carbon we can draw our methyl group off. And uh, if you forgive me, I won't draw the hydrogens on the end of those. Uh, but that is to methyl butanol. butanol. OK, maybe one more. Hexan 3 ohm. So it's a ketone from the ending. And the uh, carbonyl group is going to be on the third carbon of uh, hex is six. All right, so uh, let's draw that out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and uh, so we can number from either way, it doesn't matter. Let's number from right to left. So that's hexan 3 -ohm. That's already already done. I'll just put the bonds in, but we won't draw the hydrogens. And as quick as anything, that's that's it drawn there. Okay, so hopefully you've got the idea of um, uh, how to name the aldehydes and ketones. That's a little bit revision because we did that in uh, year 12. So let's move on. Now we move on now to uh, testing for aldehydes and ketones. And uh, when we are testing for them, we're basically just going to use either tollens or phalanx um, in order to uh, uh, oxidize them because uh, tollens and phalanx are, are oxidizing agents. Um, now, one of them we can oxidize and one of them we can't oxidize. Aldehydes we can oxidize and uh, ketones we can't. And so when uh, an oxidation reaction happens, a redox reaction happens uh, with the aldehydes, uh, we see that either in the silver mirror or the uh, brick red uh, in failings. Um, and we see nothing in ketones because there is no redox reaction because ketones can't be oxidized um, easily at least. Okay, so let's quickly write out the um, oxidation reaction for the aldehydes. Here's an aldehyde here. So we've got uh, a carbonyl group, a hydrogen, and uh, any generic um, alkyl group. And the mechanism for this, we don't need to know at A level, but uh, instead what we can do is we can just say that um, we're going to add an oxygen um, for the oxidation reaction. Uh, that's in square brackets put like that because um, it doesn't really come along as an atom, a straight atom. It's a two-step mechanism. Never mind. So when that happens, though, what you do is, is um, you get uh, the alkyl group uh, bonded to the carbonyl group, uh, which is now bonded to a hydroxyl group, making a carboxylic acid. Uh, and so if we could um, just count the electrons to um, uh, see that to assign an oxidation state. We've got an electron here, 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 and here for our aldehyde. And uh, let's just show that uh, none of those electrons really belong to the, uh, the carbon. This is carbon carbon, so they're going to share it equally. And Carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, so it has those. So it's got three electrons. So four take three is one. Uh, so that's an oxidation state of, uh, of plus one. Uh, whereas the carbon in the carboxylic acid, uh, let's draw out the electrons again. Uh, so we've got electrons in these bonds. We've got 
pair here and a pair here and with our purple pen again we will um, see how many of those electrons the carbon owns but it doesn't own any of uh, the ones that are bonded to uh, the oxygen and it only has that one there because that uh, I've got a group there is, uh, is also a carbon there uh, so four take one is uh, three right so you can see the oxidation uh, number has increased which is oxidation uh, you could also look at it, this reaction as um, uh, number of bonds to oxygen uh, which is increased from two in the aldehyde to three in the carboxylic acid so that signifies oxidation as well um, however if uh, we were to look at the ketone let's just remind ourselves that a ketone looks uh, like this and uh, if we wanted to oxidize it uh, we don't have the hydrogen that uh, see this hydrogen here on the aldehyde that I've underlined three times there on the left. Uh, that's what facilitates the reaction mechanism. And we don't have the hydrogen in uh, the ketone. Uh, so this reaction uh, doesn't happen. Uh, so that's what uh, enables us to distinguish between the aldehyde and the ketone. Okay, so let's remind us uh, ourselves of the uh, tests. Uh, this one you will recognize as, as the silver mirror test uh, from Tollens reagent. So let's write Tollens up here. And uh, Tollens reagent, you might remember, is a silver ammonia complex. Uh, so let's write it down here. So it's a silver ammonia uh, complex. Uh, you'll learn more about those complexes when we do transition metals. Um, and that silver uh, ion there has a one plus charge. Uh, and so strictly we write it like this, right? Because it's a complex, uh, but the one plus charge comes from the silver ion. And it's gonna receive an electron. Uh, so it being an oxidize, oxidizing agent gets reduced itself. Uh, reduction is gain in electrons, and this is the electron that it gains here, and it comes from the aldehyde. Comes from the aldehyde. Um, and so when it gets that, then uh, it attaches itself to the silver ion and turns the silver ion into um, silver atom which is solid at these temperatures and releases the two ammonia molecules uh, to swim around in solution. Uh, and so that's the reaction that happens when you uh, create your silver mirror with this being the silver that attaches itself to this side of the test tubes that you can see. And uh, that happens with the aldehyde, but not with the ketone. And so if it does happen, you know that you've had an aldehyde there. Okay, so that's a quick reminder of uh, tolerance. Uh, let's have a quick reminder also of um, failings. All right, so um, why don't we do that in green since I did the ketone in green? Okay, so this is failing. So it starts off uh, nice and blue like that because you've got um, copper two plus ions uh, in solution there. Uh, so the copper two plus ions are our oxidizing agent. Copper two plus ions uh, are in the failing solution and uh, they receive the electron from the aldehyde. Let's just make that double clear. So just as with Tollens, um, the copper two plus ion is the oxidizing agent gets reduced that means it's gaining an electron this is the electron that it gains and that electron comes from the aldehyde and uh, when the copper 2 plus ion um, receives that electron it turns itself into a copper 1 plus ion a copper 1 plus ion and Again, when we do transition metals, you'll learn why that uh, makes the color change. Um, but for now, you just accept that uh, it's, uh, this is the color of copper one plus ions. 
and uh, and that's if that happens, you know it's an aldehyde, and if it doesn't happen, you know that uh, it's not an aldehyde and could quite easily be a ketone. So what we just saw with the two test reactions was uh, oxidation of aldehydes, but not ketones. Uh, instead, now what we're going to do is uh, reduce the aldehydes and ketones. This we can do to both. Um, and what we might use is a um, mild reducing agent, uh, such as this one here, which is called uh, sodium borohydride. Let's write it down. So sodium boro for boron hydride, and it has the uh, the formula Na for sodium. Uh, BH4 is the borohydride and it's an interesting molecule and it uh, provides hydrogen ions. It is a not hydrogen ions, it provides hydride ions, which are very different from hydrogen ions. Uh, let's explain why. Uh, so this exists as an ionic compound. You can see it's a white uh, crystalline powder here and the sodium ions are positive as usual and the boron is bonded to four hydrogens covalently bonded to four hydrogens like this and you know that uh, boron is in group three so it's only got three electrons uh, to uh, to bond with so it must have received an extra electron and does in fact have a uh, minus charge right so uh, this uh, Borohydride ion is the negative ion, the anion, and the sodium is the uh, positive ion. Um, and uh, the function of this uh, sodium borohydride is to provide hydride ions. And let's just be clear about what a hydride ion is. It's um, it's a H minus ion, so it's a hydrogen atom with an extra electron. And what happens? Let's just switch color to green. What happens is that um, uh, the boron, which um, is not very electronegative, uh, is quite willing to let hydrogen escape uh, with the bonding electrons. So these two electrons, for example, that are in this uh, bond would, uh, would both leave with the high, this hydrogen atom here. Right? And when they do so, they would make a hydrogen atom with a pair of electrons and a minus charge because there's only one proton involved and that is a hydride ion and that's what uh, we need when we want to um, uh, reduce something when we want to give something uh, electrons this is um, a very common source of uh, uh, of hydride ions okay so um, let's have a look and see what it happens in the generic and generic reactions first with aldehydes Okay, so let's draw our aldehyde out. And uh, let's give it a couple of these hydride ions. This is how we might uh, draw them in the um, simplified equation. And when we're going to reduce it, we're going to uh, make this instead the hydroxyl group instead of a carbonyl group and a pair of hydrogens instead of one hydrogen. Um, and uh, what we can do is we can uh, we can check whether that's um, oxidation or reduction if we like in the usual way. Uh, we could sign it ox assign oxidation states to it or we could notice that um, this carbon, the alpha carbon, used to have two bonds to oxygen. Now it's only got one bond so that would signify that it's been reduced. Or you could say it's, uh, it's got one bond to hydrogen and now it's got two bonds to hydrogen. That also signifies that uh, it's reduced. Um, or in fact, we could count electrons. Let's, let's draw all the electrons in the normal way. Right, and uh, use a purple border. So uh, carbon is gonna, it's gonna have that electron, but it's gonna, not gonna have any of those electrons and it's only gonna have one of those electrons. Okay, so that's three it's got, so four take three is one, is the oxidation state of um, of this carbon. Whereas let's do the same for this uh, alcohol that it's been reduced to. Now carbon is more electronegative than 
hydrogen, so it gets those and those. It doesn't get any bonded to the oxygen, but it does get um, one of the bonds, one of the electrons in the bond to carbon. Okay, so now we've got one, two, three, four, five. So we've got a minus one oxidation state. So you can see that um, that uh, oxidation number has reduced, and uh, that confirms the third way that uh, this is a reduction reaction. Um, okay, and you'll notice that uh, this uh, molecule here, this molecule is an alcohol, and in fact it's a primary alcohol because um, we've got two hydrogens hanging off our uh, alpha carbon. So our alpha carbon, we've got two hydrogens, this one here and this one here, that makes it a primary alcohol. Let's just label that. And you probably noticed that this is just the reverse of the reaction that we did when we um, uh, oxidized alcohols, oxidized primary alcohols into aldehydes. Uh, so let's do a similar thing, uh, this time for, um, uh, for our ketone. So drawing out our ketone, we've got our alpha carbon, our carbonyl carbon, there's our uh, carbonyl group and our two alkyl groups each side of our alpha carbon. Again, we're going to... Um, Reduce it with two hydrogens, and uh, that's going to uh, give us a secondary alcohol. So, as well as our hydroxyl group, as well as our hydroxyl group, let me draw that properly. Um, because it's a, we need both of those alkyl groups still on there, and therefore only one hydrogen there. Uh, so we've got only one hydrogen hanging off our alpha carbon and two alkyl groups hanging off our alpha carbon. So uh, this alcohol that we have made is a secondary alcohol. And that's what we've made with that uh, uh, reduction reaction, starting off with a ketone. Okay, so um, that's the general reactions. What we're going to do now is uh, look at the actual uh, mechanism. It's the nucleophilic addition mechanism. So nucleophilic addition reactions. Let's have a look at this word nucleophilic uh, first. So nucleo from nucleus, right? And nucleuses are positive, aren't they? Nucleuses are polis, uh, positive. Philic uh, means to like. So something that likes uh, positive things, all right? So it's going to be negative, isn't it, if it likes positive things? Uh, and so in this case, we've got a hydride ion, uh, which is negative. It's got an extra electron, and it's going to add on. It's going to add on to an existing molecule, and uh, the two molecules we're going to add it onto are aldehydes and ketones. Uh, so let's um, let's do it for an aldehyde first. Let's do it for an aldehyde first. Uh, let's start with our generic aldehyde. We've got um, our aldehyde looking like this. Now the first thing is that uh, oxygen being uh, electronegative is going to um, make sure that the electrons spend more of their time around it than around the carbon, which is going to leave the carbon a little bit delta positive, uh, like that. And then we've um, got a situation where we've got these hydride ions, uh, possibly with our sodium uh, borohydrate. Uh, and so let's just draw our hydride ion here. So it's important that you draw the lone pair, the two electrons. And that's negative, as we said. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, realize that uh, the um, nucleophile, which is the hydride ion, is going to be attracted to the positive carbon atom. Right? And so you have to draw the, uh, the curly arrow from the lone pair. So it's slightly curly, and it's attacking the delta positive carbon. Uh, atom. As that happens, uh, carbon finds itself with five bonds, which is a bit too many. Um, and so oxygen says, thank you very much. Uh, I'll have um, 
an extra share of these pi electrons. Right, so one of these bonds to oxygen, let's call it this one here, is, uh, is, a, is a pi bond, a double bond, and uh, they're going to make their way onto the oxygen atom like that. Uh, and so then what we can do is draw out the result of that. So we've got our carbon there, still got uh, this hydrogen, still got the alkyl group. Uh, now we've only got one bond to the oxygen, and the oxygen has got uh, that lone pair of electrons and a one minus charge. And we've also got a bond to a new hydrogen here. Okay, so uh, before we move on, let's um, undo any more steps in the reaction. Let's just track some electrons like, um, like we've done before. I'm going to switch to green. Um, and so I'm going to draw these electrons here on the hydride ion as green. And they are going to make this the electrons in this bond here. And so this hydrogen here that I'm overwriting in green was this hydride ion here. And uh, this bond that I covered in black that I'm overwriting in green, uh, those electrons that made up that bond become uh, these two now green electrons. That's where they've gone. Um, and uh, the oxygen has now was sharing one of its electrons with carbon, and now it's got both of them that were in that bond. And so that's where this uh, minus charge comes from. Uh, so that's what we've got, and we've tracked those electrons. Now, as well as uh, these reactants, there are also uh, uh, solvent molecules around, and that could be a water molecule. Uh, so let's draw a water molecule. And uh, as you know, water molecule is polar. And so there could be an attraction between uh, the negative charge on this um, oxide ion or, and the delta plus on the water, on the hydrogen on the water molecule, or alternatively, um, and this is what you'll see in your textbooks, it's slightly easier, um, is that there's a hydrogen ion from an acid uh, that uh, could be floating around if uh, if there was a dilute acid in the solvent. Uh, but in any case, what happens is is that uh, this uh, negative this double bond attracts the uh, the uh, attacks the positive uh, charge of the hydrogen ion and makes a bond with it. And let's draw that out. The rest of the molecules the same. And uh, just to um, track our electrons, did, uh, just to be consistent, we had uh, these green, um, this green line pair on the uh, ox, ox, uh, oxide ion, and uh, they become this bond here, and this hydrogen that I'm underlining in green becomes this hydrogen that I've overwritten, overwritten in green. And now you have your um, primary alcohol, as we did in the uh, previous slide as well. Okay, so that's the um, uh, production reaction for aldehyde. Let's do the same for a ketone. Very similar. Um, so we've got our ketone like this. And again, our carbonyl bond is polar in the same way. And again, we've got hydride ions uh, floating around. Remember to draw your lone pair. And so what happens is the lone pair on the um, nucleophile attacks the um, positive charge on the carbon atom. And let's switch to black, draw a curly arrow like that. And that makes the uh, uh, electrons in the double bond uh, gravitate towards the oxygen. So let's draw our curly arrow like so. Um, and then what we're going to do is uh, draw that out. We won't track the electrons this time. 
So we're going to draw that out. We've got our carbon. This time we've only got one bond to our oxygen. We've got an extra double bond, an extra lone pair uh, with the negative charge. Uh, we've still got our two R groups, but now we've also got uh, a hydrogen. And uh, just to be clear, this hydrogen here came from a hydride ion, and uh, this lone pair uh, is that bond. That's not supposed to be a double bond. That's supposed to be an overwritten uh, bond there. Uh, that's the two electrons that were the hydride ions electrons and uh, this lone pair here came from this bond I'm overwriting in green on the left there. Okay, so I've, I've tracked the electrons after all um, and in the same way as the uh, oxide ion in the aldehyde attracted uh, a floating nearby hydrogen ion, it does, it does the same here. So. We've got H plus nearby. Uh, make sure you get your curly arrow starting on your lone pair of your oxygen, and then you can write out the uh, product, which is a carbon, a single bond oxygen, bond hydrogen, same two alkyl groups, the new hydrogen, the first new hydrogen. Okay, so let's, uh, let's let's track our electrons. Let's use um, or, orange this colour here. So we had uh, going to overwrite those green electrons now in orange because they become this bond here, and this hydrogen that I'm overwriting in orange uh, is this hydrogen here. Um, and now we have made a secondary alcohol, which is uh, what we get when we reduce a ketone. There you go. So hopefully you've uh, you've got those two uh, reaction mechanisms, nucleophilic addition uh, reaction mechanisms, first for aldehyde and last for ketone. So let's finish up by having a look at uh, physical properties of the aldehydes and ketones. And the physical properties we're interested in are boiling points and solubility. So let's start with boiling points and let's look at some data and then explain it. So here we've got some uh, boiling points of, um, first of all, an alkane, uh, and then with a similar MR, the aldehyde, and with a similar MR, the alcohol. So in fact, uh, we're looking at propane, ethanol, and ethanol, all with MRs uh, around about 45. Um, and we've chosen similar MRs so that the uh, van, der Waals, van der Waals can be, uh, can be about the same. Right, so we might even note that. So van der Waals, V, D, W, about the same. Um, so the explanation for the different boiling points, you'll see the uh, boiling point of the alkane, therefore of propane, is much lower than the aldehyde. And highest of all is the alcohol. Uh, so let's explain that. We can explain that by, uh, by saying that um, the bonds in the alkane are just uh, van der Bars forces. There's no uh, permanent dipoles and there's no hydrogen bonding. Uh, whereas in the aldehyde there is a permanent dipole. Okay, so let's write that in here. Permanent dipoles. Um, so we can draw a little picture of, uh, of an aldehyde. Uh, so let's have a carbon chain um, and uh, let's bond it to an oxygen and we'll have a hydrogen at the end. And what we can see is that uh, our oxygen would be delta negative, right? And our carbon here would be delta positive, right? And so if another aldehyde came along, right, and had uh, a delta positive carbon, let's just put the delta positive carbon there, then there would be a permanent dipole between that delta positive carbon and uh, the oxygen. And you notice that's not a hydrogen bond, uh, but that is a permanent uh, dipole. And then as well as that, there would be the van der Waals forces that would exist uh, between you know, the uh, carbon chains as well. Um, so that's, that's what explains that uh, permanent dipole explains the um, higher boiling point of the aldehyde than the alkane with a similar MR. And then what we can do is we can go on to the alcohol. And uh, in alcohols, you probably remember we have uh, hydrogen bonding. 
nitrogen bonding. Uh, because in alcohol we have a delta positive hydrogen um, as well as the delta negative uh, oxygen. Moving on, we can uh, now have a look at this table here, which um, gives us some aldehydes and some ketones. Uh, so here, looking at the aldehydes, our uh, chain length uh, is increasing from methanol, ethanol, propanol. And as you can see, as the chain length increases, then as so does uh, the boiling point. And the same happens with ketones. As you go from prop to bute to pent, um, our chain length is increasing and our boiling point is increasing. Uh, so we can say our conclusion from that is that um, as the chain length of either an aldehyde or ketone increases, uh, the uh, van der Waals forces will increase and therefore the boiling point will increase. One extra little point um, might be worth noting is that uh, here propanol and propanone, uh, they're just isomers of each other. Uh, but you see the aldehyde at 49 has a lower boiling point than the ketone at 56. Now the, the only difference is going to be the location of the carbonyl group with the ketone having it in the middle. Um, and that slight increase in boiling point is because Having the carbonyl group in the middle of the chain uh, makes the uh, dipole, um, permanent dipole attractions between the molecules a bit more effective and the van der Waals uh, contribute a little bit less. Whereas when you have the carbonyl group at the end of the chain, like you do with the aldehyde, propanol in this case, uh, then the dipole attractions are slightly less but the van der Waals forces are more because you've got more of the chain, uh, chains exposed to each other. Uh, but the effect of that is that uh, the overall uh, strength between the molecules is less. Okay, so that explains why similar well, isomers, the aldehyde isomer versus the ketone isomer, uh, the ketone isomer has a slightly higher boiling point. At above A level, you might uh, you might also consider something about the symmetricalness of uh, ketones also contributing to the slightly higher boiling point. That's not in your spec. Um, and one very last point on uh, boiling points is that uh, what we've looked at here in uh, with these aldehydes and ketones are uh, straight chain uh, aldehydes and ketones. If you get um, branch chains uh, or even cyclical uh, alkyl groups then that is going to decrease the boiling point. It just means that uh, the uh, dipole attractions are less effective because the, the molecules can't get uh, as close to each other as often. There's a bit of steric hindrance from the branches. Okay, so that's had a look at uh, boiling points. Let's move on to solubility. And the concept of solubility for aldehydes and ketones is the same as that uh, we saw with alcohols, i.e. you've got hydrogen bonds between the aldehydes or ketones and the water molecules. Uh, so let's illustrate those hydrogen bonds uh, first with an aldehyde. Uh, so we've got our aldehyde like this. And let's put our dipole in. And let's draw a water molecule. With its dipoles. And then, uh, of course, there's going to be a hydrogen bond between uh, the delta negative oxygen and the uh, delta positive hydrogen. And uh, those hydrogen bonds are quite strong. And that's what results in uh, the short chain aldehydes and ketones as it happens uh, being uh, very soluble in water. As the chain gets longer then uh, the hydrophobicness of the chain takes over and you would find that a long chain aldehyde or a long chain uh, ketone is less soluble in water. Just to complete this uh, story let's, uh, let's draw a ketone just to make sure it's the uh, same. And this is our carbonyl group. It's going to be delta 
negative, and that's going to be delta positive, and in just the same way, uh, we're going to have a uh, hydrogen bond between it and a water molecule, like that. Uh, so there we there we have uh, explained the uh, solubility of short chain aldehydes and ketones in water. That takes us to the end of this lesson on aldehydes and ketones. Um, all that remains is for us to check that we've covered off everything that uh, we planned to do. Um, and we had a look at nomenclature. We named a few aldehydes and ketones. We reviewed the failings and the uh, silver mirror test. And then we had a look at reducing the aldehydes and ketones uh, with hydride ions. And we looked at that mechanism as well, the nucleophilic addition mechanism, with the nucleophile in this case being uh, the hydride ion. And lastly, we've just had a look at the physical properties of uh, boiling points and solubilities. Uh, so there we have it. That's our lesson on aldehydes and ketones.